Back to the Kremlin. Vladimir Putin prepares to assume the presidency after controversial elections. But what sort of country has evolved under United Russia Party rule? And will Putin's third term cement his legacy as a czar or a reformer? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Sami Zaydan. Well, as Vladimir Putin celebrates victory in Russia's presidential elections, an emboldened protest movement is planning a long campaign against him. Well, that political opposition is just one of the obstacles he'll face when he begins six years in office. A stagnating economy, rampant corruption, they all provide challenges he may be unable or unwilling to overcome. Jonah Hull reports from Moscow. Long before the votes were counted, Vladimir Putin claimed victory, with Dmitry Medvedev at his side. This was a very important test for all of us, test of political maturity, independence, sovereignty. We showed that no one can dictate anything to us. We showed that our people can distinguish between the desire for changes and the provocations aimed at breaking up our country. Putin called it an open and honest fight. His opponents, the provocateurs, though, say that widespread reports of fraud make his election illegitimate. There is no need to be shocked or lose one's head over this. We need to look at this in a cold-blooded manner. What's happened has happened. Our aim is to strengthen the protests. Veteran opposition figure, the chess player Garry Kasparov, believes Putin is running out of moves. Many Russians, especially in Moscow, are not going to accept Vladimir Putin as a legitimate president. And even if Putin survives March and the next two months prior to inauguration, he is badly wounded, maybe even deadly wounded, as, as a political leader. And I have no doubt that he will uh, not survive the uh, next six years. To prove the point, they'll protest against Putin's election win on Monday night. This is Pushkin Square, where later this evening thousands, the organizers say perhaps 100,000 anti-Putin protesters will gather. The problem is they've only been given permission for 10,000 people. And while previous protests were allowed to last three hours, this time they've been given just one hour to rally and disperse. In defiance, the word has gone out that people should gather wherever and for as long as they like. No one quite knows how the Kremlin will react, indulging the protests as they have since December or cracking down as they did in the past. No one is quite sure yet how far the man in victory tears on Sunday night is prepared to go to defend his authority. Jonah Hull, Al Jazeera, Moscow. So, with Putin coming back to the Kremlin, is Russia heading in the right direction? Well, to answer the question, we're joined now by our guests. In Moscow, we have Roman Dobrokhotov, founder of Walking Without Putin. Also in Moscow, Sergei Alexandrovich Markov, a special electoral representative for Vladimir Putin and vice president of the Russian Economic University, Pelikhanov. And in the United Kingdom, Federico Veriz, he's professor at Oxford University, an expert on Russian politics. He's also the author of The Russian Mafia, the private protection in a new market economy. Welcome to all of you, gentlemen. If I could start with Mr. Dobrokhotov. Is Vladimir Putin's election victory a victory for democracy in Russia or a setback? No, actually, Vladimir Putin has declared a war to Russian people because he didn't won uh, at the first round, as he claims. And um, three independent uh, monitoring organizations uh, say that he has around uh, 48, 49 percent, which is maybe quite big, but uh, far less then, for example, he could uh, get in... OK, but if we could steer years. away uh, from arguing over election numbers and results at this point, let's get a little bit under the surface, if we could. Whatever the case is, it does seem like he's going into another term, right? What does that mean for Russia? Well, well I think that uh, he won't stay for six years. I think that uh, he will be out of power in several months because uh, we won't tolerate... Um, this uh, absolutely illegitimate regime and he will face 
hundreds of thousands of people today in the streets and they will not go home. So, well, why, why is he it, decided to go this way. Why is it a bad... I, get, I take it from your answer, you don't think it's a good thing if he stays in office. Why? What is he doing, do you think, to the country that isn't good? I think that um, uh, the main problem is that uh, people understand that they have uh, no real freedom of the choice. And that is not just they disgusted by Putin. They just want to uh, be the decision makers. They uh, think that they are enough... Um, grown up uh, to uh, vote for the people they want and uh, as you know not, uh, oppos um, not any oppositional leader uh, was allowed to even participate in these elections. So okay. that's not uh, about... Uh, yeah. let, let me take some of those points now to, to Sergei. I think basically what we're hearing uh, there from Dobrokhotov is the idea that he's becoming too authoritarian. Um, I think uh, that uh, in Russia uh, a lot of people took part uh, in those elections. A uh, very unpopular leader who has support of a few thousand people uh, didn't take part in election, it's true. Uh, who has no political parties, they didn't take part in election, uh, it's true. Because a weak leader, which represents only maybe, you know, uh, 50,000 people in the uh, capital, uh, but it's not enough according to uh, the uh, Russian law. This okay. law maybe uh, will be changed, uh, which allow to the marginal uh, uh, marginal uh, uh, politicians to take part in elections, you know, most important. You know, there are some falsification of elections. Sometimes it could, it could happen. But there are some sort of falsification of observation of elections. Okay, but if we could, and I'd, now, I'd like to try and, uh, and steer this discussion to, uh, away from arguing over uh, the election uh, results, if we could. And, and let's try and focus, perhaps we'll try and bring in Mr. Federico Veriz into the discussion here. You know, Russian politics is often described, and I'm sure you've heard this, as an absolute puzzle. Let me ask you this question then. Who holds power? Who are the centers of power in Russia today? Well, certainly Vladimir Putin holds a lot of power and the people around him and the people in the power uh, ministries. I think that's certainly a center of power. In a sense, what Putin has achieved is to weaken the alternative systems, the alternative elements that could weaken and control his power. So the independent TV has gone. So when the you say, sorry, when you say independent weak. and alternative systems, you mean like the other institutions of the state, the parliament, the judiciary? What are you talking about? That's exactly what I mean. I mean the parliament, the indi independent television and media system and the judiciary. This is the essence of democracy. Democracy is not just about voting and avoiding frauds in the voting system. It's also having powers that check on the government. And so the parliament and so the, the media especially is very important. And I think this has been weakened in Russia by Putin. So certainly he holds a lot of power, but that uh, I think also makes him extremely weak because of course a lot of the people who don't like him are outside the legitimate the political system and they are marching in the street. So for me, the fact that he did not allow uh, independent and alternative voices to stand against him in this direction actually show that he's quite weak. And I think he should have allowed people to stand, like the Yabraco party, because I do think he has got some support in the country. It's not that he doesn't have any support, but there is no alternative to him in the legitimate system. OK, let's take some of those points back to Sergei now and give you another chance to perhaps to respond to some of the criticisms that uh, are being made against the person you represent. And how would you respond to that accusation that actually Russia is run by informal patronage networks, the so-called uh, Siloviki networks that run the country? What's your response to that? You know, uh, you know I'm in big... Uh, uh some sense uh, agree that uh, in Russia informal institutions play uh, too big role and uh, we should move more to the formal institution and it will be one of the responsibility of Vladimir Putin to run country from the personal pa power uh, uh, kind of uh, gaullism, you know, uh, Charles de Gaulle, uh, Russian president, uh, French president who ran France uh, from the uh, uh, bad situation after World War II to the prosperous, uh, and it was Gaullism who was the ideology of those uh, political systems. Same, I would say, Putinism is uh, Russian Gaullism, and uh, uh, Vladimir Putin and Russian Charles de Gaulle. Who okay, but is he doing to, that? Uh, is he doing that, Mr. Sergei? 
For example, the accusation is that he's had too much influence over the electoral process. He's stopped people from running against him. He's had too much influence over the court and the media. How do you respond to that when you're his special electoral representative? It's true. It's true. I think it's true. And uh, Russia has some kind of personal power and the uh, role of the president is very high, not only according to the Constitution that give him a big power, also uh, extra of uh, uh, Constitution. Uh, it's because we have to move from the House of an Anarchy of the 90s. In, in 90s, we have catastrophe. In 90s, we have Russian Holocaust. And uh, Putin uh, have uh, uh, to stop it, to move uh, uh, Russian uh, and the Russian economy, Russian society from those chaos and anarchy. And he used uh, personal power, uh, partly extra constitution. And uh, finally, uh, I think his uh, role uh, not only to use this extra power, but move politi politics from the uh, personal power to the power of institution. And he understand this his this his role uh, very well. For example, uh, of course, uh, he understand if he will be successful if he will uh, give uh, power not to the some. Uh, same kind of leader. Right. Well, this is, if I could jump in, this is really interesting here. I want to go back to Roman Dobrochotov. I don't know if you're uh, we're, we're expecting this much agreement with Mr. Sergei at this point in the show. Are you heartened by the fact when you hear people like Mr. Sergei say, it's true, we need to move towards the power of institutions? Does that give you hope that that is what we'll see in the coming term? Well, uh, first of all, I wouldn't compare Vladimir Putin with Charles de Gaulle. I would rather compare his Muammar, with uh, Muammar Gaddafi, uh, who violated uh, all the human rights, all the democratic freedoms. And I think that Putin will uh, have the same end as uh, Muammar Gaddafi. And uh, all his uh, um, saying, all, all what he says about uh, switching more, uh, more power to institutions, to democratic freedoms, he said it in uh, 1999 for the first time. And uh, actually, already that time, no one uh, believed him, and uh, we were right not to believe him. Because, as you see, we see only degradation of all democratic uh, uh, rights and freedoms. We see growth of corruption. And I actually don't see any way how this uh, corrupted elite would um, democratize um, institutions. Because if, uh, the, we will have, if we have uh, freedom of press, if we have political competition, Putin will immediately lose this competition. OK, so hold, that thought. hold that this. thought on the issue of uh, corrupted elites, as you put it. And since we're going into a little bit of uh, history on the development of institutions, let's talk a little bit about what's uh, been happening. Of course, after succeeding Boris Yeltsin in the year 2000, the former KGB director held a firm grip over Russian politics. And as he returns to serve a third term as president, let's take a look at how Putin has previously exercised power. With little opposition, Putin won elections in 2000 and again in 2004 with a landslide majority of 71%. As president, Putin's reforms centralized state power. His party, United Russia, is the largest in the country and controls the Duma, Russia's lower house of parliament. In 2008, Putin stepped down to become prime minister while Dmitry Medvedev succeeded him as president. Yet many felt Putin still held power just behind the scenes. When his control of power in Russian society has been extensive, with his influence being felt in both judiciary and the media. In 2003, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, a critic of Putin and once Russia's richest man, was controversially jailed for tax evasion. Many wealthy opposition figures have also ended up as fugitives living in exile abroad. And government-controlled state television, NTV, is highly supportive of Vladimir Putin. Let's go to Oxford and speak to Federico Veriz. Is it possible or is it logical at this point to be optimistic about perhaps Putin fighting corruption and dealing with some of the points that we were just hearing from Mr. Dobrochotov there a moment ago, the corrupt elite? Can he afford to do that when it appears at least his support base is shrinking? Well, unfortunately not. And not just because his support is shrinking, it's because he doesn't uh, think that uh, the state should be reined in. His big political uh, 
program has been to increase the size of the state and to have more and more of the state in the economy. So obviously by the time you increase the state, the corruption opportunities also increase. That's why most countries where there is a low level of corruption, there is also a functioning economy that functions without the need of functionaries and officials. So even if he's not corrupt himself, which of course we don't know about that, and there are rumors that he is, but even if he's not, the fact that the state is such a prominent role all, will not give us reason to hope for the future. And of course, I think people in Russia know that he has been in power already and he hasn't done it when he was in power before. So how can we expect him to do it now? Why should we believe him now since he had all the chances to do it as a prime minister and before as president? So I don't really see corruption to be reduced. In fact, I think he thinks that the state has to be strengthened even further from what he has already done in the past. And okay, civil do you society, agree with he that, Mr. Okay. Mr. Sergei Moscow, do you agree with that? Uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. I can uh, but agree again. Uh, uh, I just want uh, to stress that uh, if you have uh, weakness institutions, uh, you uh, have to pay this by corruption, of course. Um, and uh, we have, uh, of course, domination of the money, we say, in society. Everything uh, can be bought. And uh, Putin, Vladimir Putin, try uh, to consolidate democratic, uh, not, he try to create institutions in society, not by a strong authoritarian ruling, uh, not by dictatorship, because he understands the people so tired from different mobilization. Vladimir Putin wants to allow people to leave. Uh, Vladimir Putin wants to allow the uh, people to uh, recover the economy. It's impossible to build democratic institutions where, uh, in society where most of the people are hungry and angry. First of all, we should feed people. Anyway, we will have such a result we, which we had in Egypt when uh, uh, liberalization, which had been created by such people like um, uh, Raman de Prakhotov, led to the uh, uh, power of uh, uh, Islamists and such liberals probably will be in prison uh, quite soon. I I even would say more. Uh, maybe Raman Barakhotov don't understand, but if uh, real competitive elections, very competitive uh, parliament election without any limitation will happen, we'll have anyway big chance of uh, radical nationalists and radical leftist populists uh, to come to power. And such people like uh, Raman Barakhotov will be either in prison by them oh, okay, or okay, will okay, have I, to I leave take you as a country. Here. Let's and go over and to Putin's Roman regime is those could. who protect Raman Barakhotov's right Dobrkhotov. to take part in the politics. Your reaction Mr. Dobrokhotov, to the what we just heard there from Mr. Sergei, that Vladimir Putin has tried to create independent institutions of the state. How do you see that when it well, comes it's, to it's, the it's judiciary and the media, particularly television in Russia? No. Uh, it's uh, pretty funny to listen to all of that. We um, actually every day our propagandist uh, TV channels say that. Uh, if you are not Vladimir Putin, you will have dictatorship, populist, you will all be in prison. But it's absolutely uh, insane because, you know, we see these people who come to streets, they're um, people from middle class, high educated. They know the experience of uh, European countries. They know uh, very well what civil society uh, is. And um, I think that, um, you know, we are not a, a wild uh, uh, African tribe uh, who cannot uh, deal without uh, a great father who will explain us how to build institution. Let us to do this. Let us uh, do this without um, any uh, corrupted and criminal leaders who pretend to be okay. fathers of the nation. Okay, and let me take that point briefly back. Briefly, Mr. Sergei, how do you respond to that? How, how is it that you say Vladimir Putin has tried to build strong independent institutions when during his tenure the first two terms, we've had 11 contract-style killings of journalists. We've had independent television stations either being shut down or bought up by pro-government businesses. And we've had repeated administrative uh, detention well, sentences well, issued against here. political figures. Vladimir Putin never uh, closed independent TV channels. Vladimir Putin took control no, of the No, but government ministries uh, did it, Ministry of TV Information or, or pro-government business organizations took over 
Surely he you know, has some we believe that, uh, responsibility for that. We believe that, that uh, national TV channels should be controlled not by the oligarch, not by private oligarchs who want to run the power, but they should, belo should belong to the nation. And Vladimir Putin took control of them, it's no doubt, and he will be totally supported by a majority of the people. What uh, Roman de Barakhotov is saying, it's, uh, you know, it's very kindly, very uh, uh, soft and uh, very pink, I would say. It's exactly what uh, 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 Egyptian uh, liberal uh, demonstrators um, uh, told on the Tahrir Square. Where are these people right now? They are in absolute destruction because another strong, big guys uh, real, uh, took the power. And uh, Vladimir Putin doesn't want to allow such ultranationalists to come to power. Vladimir okay. uh, Putin uh, is let's trying to make a reformation of right, the country let, let's, smoothly. Let's, let's go to Federico no, Veriz if we could and ask the, the question, do you think people in Russia at least some of them, are voting for stability, continuity, um, a return, uh, perhaps to avoid a return to the economic chaos of the 1990s. Is that what this vote has been about for at least some of the voters? Well, this vote has been about the lack of a real alternative to the Putin political program. Now, I do believe that Putin has a political program, and the political and economic program is to increase the social spending, is to increase spending for the military, to have a rather anti-Western uh, foreign policy, and that's perfectly fine. It's a sort of um, social democracy a la Russia, in a sense. And, but unfortunately, there was no alternative to that. So I do think that some people genuinely voted for him, but also, as as I said before, the issue of democracy is not just voting. The issue of democracy is to know about alternatives, to be told about them, and to have the opportunity to vote for them. Now, Yavrinsky, for instance, the leader of the Yabroko okay. Party, was not allowed uh, to on stand the issue for of, election. Since you've He's raised economic radical. issues. He's a Western economist. Mr. Vries, on Sorry? the issue of the economy, will he be able to fulfill his campaign pledges? Will he be able to reform the Russian economy? Well, you see, it depends a lot on the price of oil. The, all these promises are banking on the high price of oil, and we know that the price of oil is going down. So there is a risk of inflation, in fact, of these promises and more and more spending. So I, I think the jury is out. But really, in order for economy to grow, you need free independent institutions that adjudicate business disputes among independent business people. You don't need this uh, backstage deals and, uh, and uh, blood, as they call it in Russia, in which uh, businessmen always have to look up to some powerful person to protect them. That's the key for economic success. So there is a link between economy and politics and independent institution, independent judiciary, especially adjudicating business disputes. If you don't do that, then you're back to a state-managed economy and and we see what happened with the Soviet Union. Ultimately, it, it fails. OK, if I could take some of those points to Sergei in Moscow once again. I just want to read to you a figure uh, I have here. A government-linked think tank estimates that the middle class in Russia has now reached 20 percent of the population. And that figure could double by the year 2020. In a sense, do you think Russia is simply becoming too big to be controlled by the patronage network that you a minute ago just confessed does exist. Yes, it's true, and it's very good, and uh, uh, we, it's exactly what we repeat and repeat it. Uh, hungry and angry people cannot uh, use properly democratic freedoms. They will lead some populists uh, to the dictatorship. But uh, if uh, a country becoming more prosperous and uh, more middle class, and uh, if middle class, not only uh, small business, not only bureaucracy, but also engineering, doctors, teachers, uh, um, uh, high skilled uh, um, uh, workers, uh, it uh, uh, could lead to the uh, more proper uh, political competition, the more political, political participations and it will create uh, uh, exactly civic society as basis for democratic institutions. Okay, it's all right, goal. since we just it's got 30 goal, seconds Vladimir left, Putin. I want to give a it's chance to Mr. Okay. Roman Dobrokotov to have a quick interjection. Okay. Do you agree with that? Basically, the populism you represent will lead to anarchy. No, I think that uh, we already actually have anarchy. Uh, oh, we have a uh, rule of several oligarchs. For example, one of them, Yuri Kovalchuk, controls all the channel. Yes, he controls, uh, uh, well, some of the business, Putin, I mean, controls uh, media business, but he's not controlling the country. That is actually already anarchy. Uh, there is rule of corruption, uh, rule of criminal. I, I wouldn't say there is uh, some rule of, uh, 
uh, that there are some actually rules that uh, can uh, control the situation. It's all spontaneous, and that's why I think we are so angry now because we just want uh, to have simple rules rules of the game. That is called simply rule of law, nothing more of that. I'm, we are not looking for some new concrete political leader, not a political country, not even values, just concrete and simple um, uh, and uh, uh, European, I would say, uh, rules of uh, the right. game, rule of law. Right. Well, I guess time will tell and there's going to be plenty more time to discuss this, I have a feeling, over the years. Thanks so much to our guests in Moscow, Roman Dobrokhotov, in Oxford, Federico Veriz, also in Moscow, Sergei Alexandrovich Markov. And thank you very much for joining us on this edition of Inside Story. As always, if you want to send us your feedback, just email us your thoughts at insidestory at aljazeera.net. For now, thanks for watching.